Hello, 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 and welcome to Small Screen <laughs> Science, the podcast where we look at the science behind some of our favourite TV shows. I'm Karen. Hi, Emma, and this episode is called Blues and Two Science because we're looking at Line of Duty. We're going to be exploring some of the science behind the forensic tests and procedures, delving into the murky world of police ethics, and seeing whether what we see on TV really is true to reality. Karen, how do you how do you feel about crime dramas? I think I know. I think I might know the answer. To this one. <laughs> well, actually, I'm a big fan. I do like the cozy crime drama uh, genre. I've watched quite a lot of those, but I do like a little bit of action as well. Everyone likes a bit of action, don't they? I think so, yeah. And I think I, I have to say, though, I think I may be uh, overindulge in the crime drama a little bit, to, so much to the point I think I, I agree with Ashling B, who uh, tweeted recently, don't trust policemen if they ask if they want to go to the toilet in your house because you know what they're going to be doing. They're not going to be going oh, to the toilet. They're going to be snooping. They're exactly. going to absolutely be snooping and not just through your medicine cabinet. You know they're going to go for a little wonder you know round round yep, upstairs. through all those wardrobes this is how they do it they get they send two of them in one of them's really nice and charms you and asks for a nice cup of tea and or while you're busy popping the kettle on yeah yep. the other one goes for a little snoop you're right yeah don't trust you're them you're absolutely don't right trust them. the answer <laughs> is no <laughs> unless you're escorted i'll escort you if you like um <laughs> you can't you can't escort a police officer to the bathroom in your house karen that's how you get arrested for other things yeah this is true yeah it might look a little bit suspicious if i did that yeah <laughs> But in general, folks, please do trust the police. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I think if, you know, if we include true crime and the cosy crime and the action crime, I think it's it's definitely one of the most popular genres on the television. Mm. And um, one of the biggest, of course, in the UK is Line of Duty. And I know you're a huge fan of Line of Duty. Oh, I love it. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. So uh, for listeners that haven't seen Line of Duty, it is a crime drama <laughs> set within the police and although they do investigate um things like organized crime they also have a look at organized crime within the police force and they're actually having a look for kind of corrupt police officers and and wrongdoings and breaking of the law by officers themselves it's, it's, it's fascinating. and that's the interesting twist isn't it and it is based on you know it's based on real life and we're going to have a look you know we're going to have a look into that a little bit later in the show which would be great mm. And of course, we are sitting here playing homage to Vicky McClure as we speak, obviously. <laughs> and if you're thinking what the actual H <laughs> is she talking about, we're sitting here with our arms folded in the classic stance that she always seems to do in all the photo shoots, all the promotional materials for the show. She's She's got her arms folded. Yeah, in that classic pose. And uh, did you spot where what Emma did there? Did you? Anybody? Oh, I got my first one in. So as with every episode, we always try and weave in some stuff from the show. Um, so see how many more you can spot. There's going to be some show references and a lot of police-based cliches dropping into this episode. So uh, see how many you can spot and we will give you a full list at the end. Yes. So what can Line of Duty actually tell us about police corruption and bent coppers? You know, is it true to life? Well, during our research, we found a very interesting blog post by uh, Professor Heather Marquette from the University of Birmingham. And she spent 20 years actually researching corruption, which is a long time. She what definitely knows what career. she's talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's, she says, although it's not, you know, it's not the same as real life, it's, it's pretty realistic. And, you know, um, there are differences, clearly, but um, it does follow reasonably true to life. Yeah, so there are anti-corruption units within every police force. Um, they're just not called AC-12. That's something that the show's created to add a little pizzazz to mm -hmm. the unit that we follow. Um, for example, actually, the Met has one. Uh, it's kind of version of AC-12, but its previous nickname was called the Ghost Squad. Can you Ooh. guess why? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds very, very good. <laughs> because it was so secretive. Um, oh, so, yes, so people were you know, not really necessarily aware of it, but obviously nowadays its existence is very well known. Yeah, so they're, they're very open when they're investigating police corruption. Not mm. that there is a lot of it, but they do, you know, they are very open. That we know of. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is true. Yeah. Um, so, so, and what she also said was that uh, no copper sets out to be corrupt and it often happens accidentally. Yeah, so this is known as uh, ethical drift, actually. So it's kind of... Mm kind of happens when one or two things that happen that are a little bit ethically ambiguous create a slightly unethical situation and those situations become normalised and then that, that process kind of snowballs. So without intending to be highly unethical, you drift towards it. Yeah, and, that, and this can happen, you know, within a small team or within a, a larger force as well. 
Um, and what's uh, really interesting is that is that the things that they cover in the series are actually occurring in real life in terms of you know what's happening within the police force. So within series one, they did uh, something called laddering, and this is where you get criminals to confess to other smaller crimes. You know the the old taken into consideration thing. Um, and in the same year that that was actually you know on our television screens, some police officers in Maidstone were arrested for doing exactly that thing. How topical. And then if we jump all the way over to season five, so the most recent season, one of the big storylines focuses on undercover officers. And we're going to get into this a lot more later. But also what was really interesting is that it often looks like undercover officers are kind of given a bit of freedom to really run away with their character and and blend in. But actually, they are still bound by the same code of ethics as every kind of uniformed officer would be as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So also, while we were carrying out research for this episode, we found a really, really good paper and it's a bit of a throwback to Love Island. So do you remember when we were talking about pupil dilation in Love Island? Oh, do I? Yes. Getting larger when you're attracted to someone. That's right. And your pupils as well. Oh, oh Karen. <laughs> yeah, mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Um, well, apparently, um, your pupils actually get larger when you remember seeing something that you've seen before. And this may have a use for the boys and girls in blue. Ah, does this have something to do with being attracted to people in uniform? Oh, well, you're talking to a girl who is. I married one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so anyway back to the research Uh, this research was published in 2019 and what they did was they carried out a simulation of a crime and then afterwards they held a lineup and they while the people were kind of identifying who they thought committed the crime they were looking at the pupils and how much the pupils were dilating and what they found was that when people correctly identified the culprit their pupils dilated up to 32 percent oh wow That's whereas if they that is a lot isn't it whereas if they incorrectly identified the person the pupils didn't dilate at all oh so we can kind of use this to fact check whether what they're saying is right yeah so in theory yeah absolutely um and what was really exciting about the research was when they actually were guessing at the person in the lineups so they weren't 100 percent sure If they guessed correctly, their pupils dilated. And if they guessed incorrectly, their pupils didn't dilate. So they only dilated when they got the person in the lineup correct. Which would be really handy as well if we could bring this to a stage where we can actually use it in the police force because the research isn't quite there yet. But, you know, we all know that eyewitness identification, it can be flawed. It's not often relied on in court as a form of identification because lots of different things can affect recall. So things like stress and the length of time since the incident might have an impact on who people are recognising in the lineup. But what do we know? You know, for this episode, we needed to actually speak to someone who knows a lot more about how the police actually operate. Exactly. So we took the squad car on over to Bath Spa (laughs) University to meet the Dr. Alison McVean, a professor in policing and criminology who is an expert in police ethics. Now, her work and research have helped shape how the police force in the UK use an ever-developing code of ethics to guide their practices and their ways of working. Yeah, and she explained to us that policing doesn't actually happen in black and white. You know, it's grey, it's a grey world and mistakes are made. And by having a code of ethics and framework, what you're doing is you're making things much clearer and it makes it easier to make and justify decisions and the implicit becomes explicit. Absolutely. Now, with questions of morality raised in every series of Line of Duty and a huge emphasis placed on defining not just what's right and what's wrong, but what's what's actually ethical and what's not, you know, who who better to speak to? So over to Alison. So a lot of your research is to do with ethics. How does ethics play a role in the police force as we know it today? Ethics is an interesting word because it means so many different things to so many people. But when it's applied in a police setting, you know, when police officers have to think about it in, in you know, their operational duty, um, I think it's more easily understood by uh, a number of components. And that is ethical decision making, ethical leadership ethical behavior ship uh, ethical behavior and ethical conduct what what's happening now is actually we're making it more explicit and putting it in a framework that we can consciously be much more aware of 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 the impacts of what what it means to be ethical 
and this code of ethics that the police force currently use, what does that mean kind of for the day to day? Okay, so the police code of ethics was introduced in 2014. And it's quite interesting because actually it's a statutory code of ethics. And what I mean by that is actually it's embedded in a legal framework. So the police officers and police staff are legally obligated to that code. And that makes it quite interesting. Because if you, you know, have to... um, be trustworthy and honest and, and uphold the standards. I mean, how does that actually operate in, in, in operational practice? And particularly if you're a covert police officer, mm. where by the very nature of covert uh, policing, you are being deceitful. You know, you are using um, surveillance, very intrusive, undercover tactics. So what does it mean to police officers? You know, words such as trust, such as honesty, is very much an individual thing, which is why we link it back into how they behave as a person, as a leader, rather than just, you know, loosely use those words, which are quite nebulous. And so it's also more about undercover work and covert operations. Those are two themes that kind of come up quite often if we're talking about TV shows or creating narratives and stories around police work and cases. Yeah, I suppose there is. It's because, you know, it's probably perceived to be a more exciting element of policing. Mm. Um, The police uh, tactic of covert or undercover surveillance is actually fairly tightly scrutinised. So they actually have to have it signed off to make sure that it's legal, Mm -hmm. it's necessary, that it's proportionate. Is there any other way they can get that information or intelligence? Uh, you know, it, it's seen as the last resort to, to, to get it. Because when they do covert or they put on surveillance, it may be just on one person, but there's always secondary harm because that one person will have family mm. and those family may include children that are also, by the very nature of, of, of the operation, uh, will also be surveilled. Um, covert policing is essential particularly for certain crimes, serious and organised crime, for terrorists, for some of the drug stuff. I mean, it is, you know, a a valuable tactic. So do you think you'd make a good undercover cop? I mean, as much as I'd like to think so, I am a terrible liar and I sweat a lot when I'm nervous. (laughs) So I think I'd be be rubbish, to be honest. What about you? Uh, No, no, same here. I would be absolutely rubbish. Yeah, my acting skills are not the greatest. I mean, I've seen them and I agree with that. <laughs> I would love to be a detective, though. I, uh, I think in another life, I'd definitely be, be a Rosa, you know, one of the fans. I would, I'd love to be a detective. So a member of the thin blue line. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I well, I enjoy podcasting. I think this is much more fun. Um, a bit less dangerous as well. Yeah, I think so, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, this code of ethics is designed to get rid of unethical behaviour and it targets corruption within the police force and officers of all levels are held accountable for their actions and it makes this corrupt behaviour much harder to get away with. Which traditionally is uh, not very good telly, but line of duty does make this pretty gripping. Yeah, they do it really well. And Alison had some more stuff to say about corruption. She did indeed. So talk to us about the role of kind of power and authority within the police itself, because there's been a lot of um, kind of crime drama looking at internal police corruption and and how people possibly progress with the more power and authority they get. If you'd asked that question 20 years ago, you could have easily pointed out that, you know, most of the corrupt police officers were lower down the ranks. And yet over the last decade... There's been a lot of focus about the senior leaders being corrupt and being corrupt at a number of different levels, i.e. by um, exploiting and abusing, you know, their power for, fe- you know, to females within the organisation, uh, right through to getting their families and friends jobs, through to, you know, using cars, you know, this sense of entitlement around it. Uh, And I think one thing the police have been really good at over the last few years is looking at all of that and it just not being acceptable. And I think that is something around what I mean by an ethical culture. Mm. You know, even such things as declaring gifts and gratuities through to ethics committees where people can raise issues. Uh, And, you know, you get issues raised such as, why is it, you know, chief officers have private health insurance paid by the force and we don't? Actually, there's a very good reason for yeah. it because, you know, if these 
senior police officers are making some key decisions. So if they're going to be ill, you want them straight back at work quicker than... So, but, you know, it's actually making them really accountable for, for what they're doing. So there's a lot more... What would you say to people that would say that now there's a lot more kind of red tape and regulation um, around all of these ethics and, and questions of morality? But what would you say to people that would say it's getting in the way of kind of, quote-unquote, real police work? No, it doesn't get in the way. It enhances real police work. It's not red tape. Ethics is something only you can do. I can't put my ethics on you because it's about your leadership, your decision making, your behaviour and your conduct. So it's to support them. It's not regulating them. It's not red tape. It's absolutely, and it's giving them accountability. So decisions they make, and I use the example of Cressida Dick making ethical decisions means that she can explain a behaviour when things go wrong, which it will do in policing because of the very nature of policing. Oh, it was great that we were able to speak to someone who really knows about how the police actually work. Yeah, and she was really interesting. She got loads and loads of different stories. And one of the first things we noticed about her was her FBI lanyard. I mean, how cool. Yeah. And she'd actually worked with the FBI on one of the first huge internet child abuse cases and she's also used you know criminal profiling a hugely interesting background it was so cool it was it was really interesting i loved speaking to her um that particular case the fbi one was such a cool insight into how criminal profiling works and how that field has evolved um mm. so i think i mean should we give it to our patrons spoilers uh oh yes uh <laughs> screw it it's the end of the season uh yeah. we are starting a patreon account uh to help us get season two up in the air later this year um we are going to be showing loads of bonus content because we've got so many amazing things from all of our interviews and mm. i think this should be this is going to be one of the first things that we put up for our patrons because oh my was this a really cool anecdote yeah definitely really really interesting and one of the other things that we spoke to her about is um, how crime dramas can workshop the image of the police. If you go back, um, most of the crime dramas were about dirty cops and about them, you know, getting away with, well, literally murder in some cases. Mm. Um, and that was going on for decades. And what's really interesting about Line of Duty is it's kind of twisting that format and it's looking at how do we, you know, how do we protect the public when there are corrupt police officers um, how do we use this uh, code of ethics? And what it, this is doing is helping address uh, the public's perceptions of the police and increasing the trust in the police within the country. Absolutely. And then, of course, the other half of line of duty, um, mm. we're talking epic shootouts, high octane drama. Yes. This is the next half of our episode. Yes, and uh, the tragedy of this is that we were supposed to be going to a ballistic centre. We were going to be firing some guns and uh, chatting to some ballistics technicians about how you know how guns work, how rifles work, etc. Um, but unfortunately, couldn't do it. <gasps> COVID nineteen. Yes. So instead, we recorded yeah. uh, just a normal interview um over the internet while on lockdown in all of yes. our respective homes in lockdown yeah so what we spoke to uh paul everington and he's director of ms instruments and managing director of the wiltshire ballistic services so at this range they have a lab and they undertake all kinds of really interesting tests and they use science and a really deep understanding of ballistics to assist in police matters uh, now this field is known as forensic ballistics but before we get into what they do, um, let's talk pretty simply about how modern guns actually work. Yeah, so if you if you start with uh, pulling the trigger mm -hmm. um, and then the hammer will hit a firing pin. Okay. And then that firing pin hits the primer and that's what causes uh, the powder to burn. Gunpowder. Gunpowder, yeah, right. basically. And when that happens, um, lots of gases are produced during the chemical reactions that are happening there. Mm -hmm. um, and those gases are obviously in a very tight space um, and they need to be able to expand because they're very hot gases. Um, and as they're expanding, that, that creates this pressure and it's that pressure that pushes the bullet out along the barrel and then out of the muzzle of the gun. Should I be worried about how much you know about guns? Well, I am married to an ex-soldier, so that's that. Oh, explains. okay, sure. Yeah, don't blame him. <laughs> so anyway, let's pick up with Paul as he explains to us why stability is important, not just for accuracy, you know, if you're shooting someone, but also because the very mechanism that provides stability of a bullet can offer quite a lot of clues to investigators. Yes, indeed. We'd love to ask you what rifling is uh, and, and how that can be used. Okay, so 
you've, you've got a, a bullet, but you want this stability. So what you do is you induce, introduce this thing called rifling. Now that in broad terms is, uh, if you imagine a tube, which has got a groove, a spiral groove along it, but it's not a groove. Okay, it's a land, it's a bit that pokes up. So what happens then is as you put the uh, cartridge case in the back of the chamber of the gun, so a gun is basically a tube, but at the end of it, it's got a slightly widened bit for the cartridge case, which is bigger than the bullet, to fit in. Oh, yeah. Then, then what happens is that the bullet head engages with the back of the main tube, um, which is the right calibre of the bullet head, and then hits against these lands, these pokey up groove things. Yeah. As soon as you hit this with a very big hammer, it then gets forced down the tube. But of course, because you've got those spiral grooves, it's now forcing it to twist. So now the bullet is, is starting to twist down the barrel and sort of one in seven twist uh, is a typical sort of rate. So it then comes out of the barrel. Now for the first, it depends on the caliber, but for the first sort of 10, 15 meters, the bullet's very unstable. So it's sort of rotating about like this. Um, but eventually, because of this, this rifle induced spin, it then stabilizes into a very smooth uh, rotation. Now, coming to the forensic bit, What's really interesting is that you've now put some indentations in the bullet head. And it's those indentations that the forensics guys can use to identify where it's been fired from. Because over time, those lands, those inverted grooves, if you like, in the barrel will be pitted. There'll be indentations, damage on it and so on. So as the bullet uh, travels down there, it will pick those up and you get score marks on the bullet. So when you have a post-mortem or you manage to extract the bullet from the scene of crime, for example, you would then look at that and you would see very clear, almost like fingerprint score marks on the bullet head. So what you do is if you get hold of the original gun, you then fire a bullet through that and the two score marks should be identical. Oh, wow. So you can you can trace it back to the exact gun that was used at the, at the potential crime scene as opposed to just the make and the model. Uh, you're, you're yeah, it's the exact gun, because the gun will wear differently for every single uh, shot fired. So provided you manage to get the gun just after the crime, the indentation should be almost identical. I mean, really is fingerprint sort of accuracy. So whilst you set, you set out to put rifling in there to give you greater travel, the side effect of that is to put these indentations and markings on the bullet head, which you then use with a comparison microscope uh, to look very carefully at them and say, okay, those those two match. So you can say, well, look, this bullet we found at the scene of crime is linked to that gun. So if you wanted to get away with it, you want to use a musket rather than a rifle. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're quite right. It, it is the lack of rifling um, that, that's your best clue there, yeah. So we were going to go and fire a gun uh, ourselves, as we've mentioned, which means that we would have been able to experience yeah. recoil, uh, which is something that you see in dramas quite often. And this is this is where the gun kind of bounces back and hits you after you shot um, or after you fired it. And Paul was going to explain it to us practically. Uh, but of course, that wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't possible. So science yep. teacher Karen, mm -hmm. get your physics hat on. Walk me through uh, recoil. Well, um, so it's all about momentum. Mm -hmm. So at the start, before you fire your gun, the, the whole thing, the gun, the bullet has got zero momentum. It's not going anywhere. It's not moving. Uh, so you pull the trigger and the bullet is traveling at a very high velocity in one direction. Now, um, it's clearly got momentum. But due to the conservation of momentum, mm -hmm. once you've fired it, it should still be zero momentum. Right. So in order for that to be the case, your gun has to recoil in the reverse direction to where, wherever the bullet's going. Um, and then if you added the momentum of the bullet and the gun together, then that would come to zero mm -hmm. again. Um, and the reason why the gun isn't traveling at the same velocity as the bullet, which is what you'd expect, isn't it, is because the gun has got a greater mass. Mm -hmm. So momentum is about MV, mass times velocity. So the mass of the mass of the gun is taken into consideration. So that's why you have recoil, conservation of momentum. Ah, I see. So we've explored what it's like to be behind the weapon, but mm -hmm. what about if you're if you're in front of it? You know, Wiltshire Ballistics also look at the science behind getting shot. Now, loads of people get shot in line of duty. That is not a spoiler if you haven't seen the show. <laughs> um, so let's have a look at some of the other tests that they do in this forensic ballistics laboratory. What, what you've got is a, a gel block and you've got to make it out. It is essentially jelly. 
Mm -hmm. um, made in a similar way to jelly, but it's mar far more uh, strictly controlled in terms of quality. Uh, you would tend to make it with a 10% or 20% mix, uh, which leads to a certain sort of hardness of the gel. Uh, in the case of 10%, it's sort of representing ordinary flesh of the body. In 20%, it's sort of bone uh, parts of the body. So it's, it's a slightly inexact science, obviously, but what you're trying to do is to simulate that if a bullet went through the body, what sort of effect would you see? Uh, and again, what you can't see on those those slides, unfortunately, but you can see on the video, uh, is what we call the cavitaceous effect. All right. Uh, so when the bullet goes through the body, the most common question I get is, uh, Paul, you know, the bullet is sort of this kind of diameter, you know, provide, okay, if it hits you there, you've got a problem. Um, but if not, you know, why does it kill you? Uh, well, the problem is that when you look at the uh, gel there, which is about 10 centimetres, maybe, uh, or even bigger, um, that gel will expand to about half as much again oh, as the bullet goes through. Wow. So the bullet goes through and, and the residual cavity is tiny. It actually reseals itself quite well. Um, but as the bullet goes through, you actually see a, a massive expansion like this. So, you know, I would say, let's say um, 15 centimetres, something like that, uh, of expansion. So if you hit someone sort of, you know, just uh, a lower stomach area, yes, it would cause damage there, but it's the energy that is dissipated through that bullet going at such a high speed. Don't you remember your physics from school? It's half mv squared, okay? So the mass of the bullet is a relatively minor part of it. The velocity is squared. So however fast it is, it's squared to give you a huge amount of energy. And it's that energy that then sort of crushes the organs and, and kills people eventually. Anyone else uh, hungry for jelly right about now? <laughs> Not if you've seen the images, are you with me? <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll, we'll put those on our Instagram for you to see. <laughs> uh, Paul wasn't wrong about the amount of expansion of the jelly. Oh. It's quite scary. Um, so back to the physics, um, one of the things they actually look at at Wiltshire Ballistics is the amount of energy that the, the bullet's got when it's fired. Because if, you, you know, if you're if you going to attack someone with a weapon that's lethal or a weapon that's dangerous, it's all down to the amount of energy that the bullet's got. And if, you, you know, if you're shooting someone with a lethal weapon, then you're intending to murder them, basically. You're intending to kill them rather than just injure them. And that's quite serious, clearly. Yeah, so it helps the police kind of categorise the crime that they can charge you with, which is quite useful. Mm. So one of the things they also do at the centre is they test Kevlar vests, so these mm. bulletproof vests that the police use. Now, Kevlar is a synthetic heat-resistant strong fibre, and it's, it's woven um, really tightly in layers that forms a plate. And then this plate, which has about 18 to 20 layers of Kevlar in, is put inside the vest that um, the police wear. And this Kevlar is knitted so tightly that that's what gives it these kind of bulletproof properties. It can stop a bullet from passing through. Yeah, and Kevlar was actually developed by a female chemist. Um, it's a Polish-American chemist called Stephanie Kwalek, yeah, which is back in the 1960s. Very cool. Yeah, and um, and as as you said, you know this this Kevlar gets stronger as the as the bullet hits it. And it, what it does is it absorbs and dissipates the energy. And the more energy that this Kevlar can actually absorb, the less energy is being passed onto your body and therefore the less damage is being done. Absolutely. So you're likely to still get quite a big indentation, uh, up mm. to three centimetres. So you could break a rib um, if you yeah. were shot in that area. But of course, uh, if the bullet doesn't pass through, I'd take a broken rib any day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it can keep people safe, which is great. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, we did ask uh, Paul one little extra question at the end of the interview. Are you going to include that in the episode? I am. You know what? It's not a silly question. <laughs> we both we both wanted to know it and the we answer did. was fascinating. And yeah. do you know what? Yeah, I'm definitely going to put it in. And it's full of science. It's relevant to line of duty. And I think that the listeners would have asked the same question. Absolutely. If you were as a policeman... Um, getting shot at would you hear the shot before you got shot or would you get shot first and realize it later so it depends what weapon the the villain is using so for example if they're using a rifle which which normally they wouldn't be because it's a large uh item to carry around uh is one answer and if they're using a pistol broadly speaking it's another answer what it comes down to is the velocity uh, of the projectile and it's all to do with the speed of sound so the speed of sound is uh, notionally 330 meters per second at zero degrees C. 
Uh, obviously, as it gets a little bit warmer, um, that, that figure goes up a little bit. Um, and this is where you had discussions in the past about the sonic boom, uh, Concord and all this sort of thing. And you may have seen some videos where you see this typical cone shape behind the bullet. That's the supersonic shockwave. Oh. And then as the, the bullet goes slower, the supersonic shockwave sort of changes shape. And then as it goes to the transonic region, uh, you know, speed you know, between above the speed of sound and below the speed of sound, it then goes flat. Um, and then below the speed of sound, it's not there. The supersonic shockwave has gone. So the boom that you used to hear from Concorde, um, that's the supersonic effect. So what you're hearing with a rifle, for example, is you're hearing the, the blast from the gun. That's just because gunpowder has exploded. Then you're hearing the supersonic crack uh, of the bullet flying through the air. So from the, the uh, person who's being shot at perspective, um, will they hear that blast before the bullet passes nearby? Uh, well, of course, that comes down to velocity. If it's subsonic, uh, they will hear the blast before the bullet uh, arrives. And if it's supersonic, they won't. So in broad terms here, um, a handheld pistol is subsonic and rifles are supersonic. And that mm -hmm. means that it's faster than the speed of sound. Yeah. So if you're being shot by a pistol, uh, which is what you kind of generally see in crime dramas yeah. at close range, you would actually hear it first. Yeah. Only just there. You wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Oh, no, I don't think I'd be able to react <laughs> quite that fast. No. Um, we found another paper, actually, um, about uh, ballistics research. This one was from 2018, and it was about the impact of breast enhancements protecting against small firearms fire. Which is not something that we expected to stumble across in our research for this episode, I have to be honest. But it was uh, it was fascinating. So it kind of covered some similar experiments to the ones that are carried out at, at Wiltshire Ballistics. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the research actually showed that the saline breast implants actually significantly reduced the, how a bullet can penetrate or how far a bullet can penetrate. Um, mm -hmm. So by hitting it, it directly slows the bullet down. It creates the bullet to, to mushroom in shape. Um, it actually expands. And this changes the bullet coefficient. And nice. Can I just right? Okay, in my notes here, we've got a little little script. The bullet coefficient, the bit that has changed, um, is a measure mm -hmm. of tit's ability to overcome air <laughs> resistance. I don't think that's a bit right. Of a Freudian <laughs> slip there, ladies and gentlemen. Oh dear. Also, great. What are you doing? Um, so it changes the bullet coefficient, which is a measure of its ability to overcome air resistance. So basically, it slows it down and can reduce the impact. Um, not, yes. of course, that we're recommending substituting body armour for fake boobs. No, non-Newtonian boobs not <laughs> recommended here. <laughs> I can't believe we're ending the entire series on boob ballistics. Like, we're serious science journalists, after all. Yes, what have we, what have we come to? <laughs> well, as you mentioned, that's probably all we've got time for for this episode. It is. So um, if you were playing along, trying to spot some of our cliches and our terms, uh, things that we got in, right, we, we kicked off the episode with hello, hello, hello. That was good. That's mm -hmm. the earliest we've managed to squeeze one in so far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got the blues and twos. We did mention Vicky McClure and we got H in. Um, yeah. We talked about bent coppers and AC12. Yeah. Uh, we referenced the boys and girls in blue. Mm -hmm. We took our squad car on over to Bath Spa University. Uh, we trod the thin blue line and decided that we'd uh, quite like to be rosers and the fuzz. Uh, we had a look at Dirty Cops, and that's it. We did. Um, so before we go, uh, you did spoil it earlier, but uh, we're starting a Patreon. Uh, <laughs> so if you'd like to help us run our website, uh, carry out research, edit and produce these episodes, cover some of the costs of edit editing software, um, and help us to interview some amazing people in person you know, feel free to come on over to Patreon and support us. Yeah, for as little as buying us uh, a coffee a month, yes. you can you can be a part of the show and really help us get season two off the ground. We're already working on it. I know you must be terribly mm. excited. Um, but of course, for our patrons, we're going to be providing lots of bonus content. Uh, we've got lots of extra bits of the interviews because they're all fascinating people and we can't share the entire thing. Um, we'll also let you choose TV shows that you want us to include in upcoming seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even help us name the episodes and we'll also give you a big shout out. Um, and don't forget, you can also find out more, uh, of course, on our website and on our social media. Absolutely. So if you want to look on Instagram, we're at small screen sci pod, Twitter at small screen sci, email small screen sci at gmail.com, Facebook small screen science podcast, 
And also, if you'd like more information, maybe follow some of our blog posts and have a look at our research and where we found our information, you can find us at smallscreenscience.co.uk. You can indeed. So, evening all. We'll see you next series. Oh. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>